Hello, this is Kyle. So in this long-awaited second part of my Literature Corner video on the Bloody Chamber, I'm going to be focusing on some of the other stories in the collection besides the titular story. The three I'm going to be examining in particular are The Courtship of Mr. Lion, The Tiger's Bride, and The Company of Wolves. However, every one of the stories in here is uh, filled with Angela Carter's signature layers of symbolic meaning, which means that all of them are great to close read and to pick apart, and so I'd really encourage you to do that. So, how do we begin to pull apart a piece of writing like The Courtship of Mr. Lion? Well, one good place to start is with the opening sentence. After all, a good literary critic or analyst will have something to say about every line. So, for example, in The Courtship of Mr. Lion, it opens with just a pronoun, her, as opposed to the character's name, Beauty, this being based on the fairy tale Beauty and the Beast. This could be interpreted as showing that Beauty's gender is one of the most important aspects of her character, or even that she is somehow universally representative of all women, similar to the protagonist in The Bloody Chamber, who is not given a name at all at any point. This would make sense, considering that the story is addressing some wider issues associated with gender, which I will come to later. When Beauty's father and we the reader first encounter the beast's domain, it is presented as an isolated location, enclosed in a kind of gothic boundary, with the house being described as a place of privilege, where all the laws of the world as he knows need not necessarily apply. The beast is shown to be very wealthy, and it's interesting how that wealth and excess is characterised through a connection to animal imagery. There is, for example, the spaniel with a diamond necklace, and of course the solid gold knocker in the shape of a lion's head. Remember that the beast himself is described as a lion. Beauty is, at least initially, the complete opposite. This lovely girl, whose skin possesses that same inner light, so you would have thought that she too was made all of snow, pauses in her chores in the mean kitchen to look out at the country road. Nothing has passed that way all day. The road is white and unmarked as a spilled bolt of bridal satin. Instead of animal imagery, we get this sense of fairy tale, almost divine innocence, especially with the white and bridal motifs. This will, of course, change later on. In return for restoring her father's fortune, Beauty has to stay with the Beast in what is really a form of blackmail, again linking to excess and corruption. However, Beauty and the Beast do begin to talk to each other and they get on well, even if Beauty struggles to adapt to the Beast's otherness. At this point, you notice she mostly focuses on what makes the Beast different from a human, for instance being shocked at him leaving the room on all fours. However, she does say that she will come back to visit the Beast. It is then, as she travels to London, where the huddled warmth of humanity melts the snow before it has time to settle, that we see a transformation in Beauty's character. Instead of being the girl who appears to be made of snow, we're told that her skin is plumping out a little, with high living and compliments. And there is even reference to animal imagery, with pampered, exquisite, expensive cats. There is an argument that Beauty and the Beast have swapped places, with Beauty becoming the Beast by taking on more masculine traits, while the Beast, alone and vulnerable in his tiny room, has become like a fairy tale princess taking on a more feminine identity. Just like at the beginning of the story, neither of them are really fulfilled in their respective roles. However, perhaps it is their shared experience at both ends of the spectrum that allows them to identify with each other more when Beauty finally does return. This time she focuses on what it is about the Beast that makes him more human, such as him having eyelids like those of a man. The Beast then transforms into a man and we are given a definitive closing image. Note the switch to the present tense, adding a further sense of finality. Mr. and Mrs. Lion walk in the garden. The old spaniel drowses on the grass in a drift of fallen petals. 
Although it is Beauty, we assume, who takes the Beast's surname, this is also the first time, apart from the title, that the surname Lion is revealed to the reader. So from a narrative point of view, they both kind of take the name at the same time. Therefore, I'd argue that this marriage is one meant to symbolise equality, both of the characters and their respective genders. The next story in the collection, The Tiger's Bride, is again based on Beauty and the Beast, and therefore invites obvious comparison with the courtship of Mr. Lion. The main difference between them is that whereas in the latter, the Beast eventually becomes human, The Tiger's Bride is all about rejection of humanity, or at least a particular sort of humanity, the kind that is superficial and unobjectifying, and is completely epitomised by the protagonist's father. Now, this character just makes me want to bang my head against a brick wall, which I'm sure was Carter's intention. Every single thing he does is selfish or just plain pathetic. After losing his own daughter through gambling, he tries to shift the blame and place it on the betrayal of his cards upon the table. After that, he whines and whinges and wants the protagonist to give him a rose. Compare that to the lengths that Beauty's father goes to to acquire a rose for his daughter in the previous story. Much of the imagery at this point centres around corruption and the loss of in innocence, such as the blood smeared on the rose, or the snow that stops falling. At first it appears that the beast is equally corrupt. He is a deceiver who wears a mask initially, and he is also very wealthy, which tends to be synonymous with corruption. A crucial detail, however, is when the protagonist notices that the Beast bought solitude, not luxury, with his money. His wealth is merely a means to escape the corruption of humanity. Indeed, as soon as the Beast reveals his true form as a tiger, the protagonist immediately states that nothing about him reminded me of humanity. The gothic trope of masks and disguises is a prominent theme in The Tiger's Bride, and I would argue that the whole business of removing clothes links into that as well. Clothes are like a mask in a way, because we use them to present ourselves in a certain way, and we make judgments of others based on what they are wearing, so they can easily be considered a symbol for deception and corruption. As the narrator says, it is not natural for humankind to go naked, not since we first covered our loins with fig leaves. The conclusion of the story seems to take this idea a step further. Each stroke of his tongue ripped off skin after successive skin, all the skins of a life in the world, and left behind a nascent patina of shining hairs. My earrings turned back to water and trickled down my shoulders. I shrugged the drops off my beautiful fur. It suggests that even the physical human condition is just another disguise or another layer to be stripped away, which is exactly what happens to the protagonist. Now, the motif of removing clothes makes a return in the final story I'll be analysing in this video, The Company of Wolves. It is an adaptation of The Little Red Riding Hood, which Carter ends with the protagonist seducing the wolf. Now, I'll be returning to that scene later, but first of all, I think it is important to note that the story doesn't follow the traditional structure of beginning, middle and end. Instead, it opens with a series of anecdotes warning of the dangers of werewolves and describing some of the mythology behind them, including their supposed lifespan. You have to question why Carter is doing this, and as far as I can tell, there is a reason which in fact links directly into the resolution of the story. Here's an excerpt from the second paragraph. If a wolf's eyes reflect only moonlight, then they gleam a cold and unnatural green, a mineral, a piercing colour. If the benighted traveller spies these luminous, terrible sequins stitched suddenly on the black thickets, then he knows he must run, if fear has not struck him stock still. Notice the repetition of if and the consequent emphasis on the indetermined or unknown. It is fear of the unknown, which I argue the wolves actually represent, all of these anecdotes together form a mythology, not unlike the mythologies that we create as humans when, cr when confronted with anything that we don't know or don't understand, because we are afraid of what lurks in the shadows or in amongst the wicked trees that go fishing on behalf of their friends, or what happens when we die. 
Crucially, when the wolf preys on Granny, she is described as three quarters succumb to the mortality the ache in her bones promises her. The wolf, in this case, then, is like a physical manifestation of her imminent death come to take her away. Superstition and religion continually reappear in the company of wolves. For example, Granny has her Bible for company, and don't forget the man who would sing to Jesus all day. Neither of them are protected, because really that uh, superstition is just another element of the mythology surrounding the unknown, and a symptom of our fear of it. Enter into this the protagonist, Red Riding Hood. She stands and moves within the invisible pentacle of her own virginity. She is an unbroken egg. She is a sealed vessel. She has inside her a magic space, the entrance to which is shut tight with a plug of membrane. She is a closed system. She does not know how to shiver. She has her knife and she is afraid of nothing. It is her innocence that protects her in a strange way, because if the wolf is symbolic of fear, then she has no fear or superstition. She's not going to pull a Bible at the wolf like it suggested Granny will do. Instead, she faces the situation rationally. She's not ignorant of what's happening. It's stated quite clearly that she knew she was in danger of death. But she also knows the worst wolves are hairy on the inside. Again, there's that critique of humanity making a return. Perhaps, like in The Tiger's Bride, there is a kind of rejection of humanity going on when the protagonist removes hers and the wolf's clothing, but I'd argue it is as much about a figurative of casting away of those protective layers of stories and superstition we cling on to. There is also the sexual aspect to the scene, and it is important to note that the protagonist's newly awakened, unfulfilled sexual awareness places her in the unique position of being able to seduce the wolf while simultaneously being innocent enough to sympathise with him, which is ultimately what saves her. The final line, sweet and sound she sleeps in Granny's bed between the paws of the tender wolf, is concise and conclusive, much like the ending to Mr. Lion, and it provides a contrast to the long, meandering set of mythological anecdotes from earlier. So those are some of the key points that would be in my close reading of three of the short stories from The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. As always, be sure to take my analysis a step further by applying your own ideas, and maybe consider what I've said in relation to some of the other stories in the collection not covered in this video. While you're doing that, also don't forget to check out my website and my Facebook. Like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.